Hello friends, Steve Stockton here with you. Welcome to our latest video. In this episode, we'll be taking a look at 10 celebrities or famous people that have gone missing and were never found. Now, inasmuch as celebrity or fame is not an easy commodity to measure, these stories are presented in a random order, so we feel that any one famous person is not necessarily more famous than another. Join us. Number 10, Richie Edwards, also known as Richie Maniac. Richie was born December 22, 1967, in Cardiff, Wales. He was a guitarist for the band called Manic Street Preachers and was reported missing February 1, 1995, at just 27 years old. Belonging to the so-called 27 Club is not a membership most would be willing to complete the demands to get into. Famous musicians that have joined this exclusive club over the years are the likes of Janis Joplin, Jimi Hendrix, Jim Morrison, and Kurt Cobain, to name just a few. What do these people in this club have in common other than being famous musicians? They all died at the age of 27. Now, making the rock scene in the late 80s, Manic Street Preachers put a new spin on the commonplace rock and roll to time. Not wanting to be linked to any one type of music, the guitar player and songwriter was cutting edge for the time. The music they were producing has been compared to The Clash Meets Guns N' Roses, according to one news article. Richie Edwards was seen as the leader of the group, but the truth is that it was he and the bass player, Nicky Wire, that shared the responsibilities of songwriting just the same, and other production ideas were also shared. Richie's charisma, intelligence, and artistic voice drew people in and made it easy to interview him. A seriously introverted person, Edwards was careful with his words in interviews and took that part of fame very seriously. It said that he wanted fame more than anything and was obsessed with image and notoriety and described as vain in many ways. Edwards was also a deeply introspective poet. Other band members remember their missing bandmate as someone who wanted to become an image for the discarded and disenfranchised while being adored and taken seriously. In fact, he was so serious that during an interview, after telling the reporter that the band was for real, Richie actually carved the number four and the word real into his arm with a razor blade. Required 18 stitches to tidy it all up. The band would release three records before the mysterious disappearance of Richie Edwards, so they aspired to be the biggest band in the world. Generation Terrorist, The Holy Bible, and Everything Must Go. Edwards disappeared between the days of February 1st and 14th of 1995. His Vauxhall car was found near Severn Bridge, parked and looked as though it had been there for a few days. The spot is infamous for jumpers, and while it was said that Edwards was severely depressed, he seemed to be coping by drinking and reportedly had a prescription for Prozac. His family was reluctant to declare him deceased rather than missing, in 2008, his status was upgraded to missing, presumed dead, even though there were still reports of sightings of Edwards all around Asia. Arguably one of the greatest mysteries in rock and roll history, the disappearance of Richie Edwards at age 27 was something that his friends said he would do just to establish himself as a cultural martyr, just as he wanted since his early teen years. Number 9. James Anthony Sullivan also known as Jim Sully Sullivan, or just Sully. He was born August 13, 1940, in Nebraska, played football in high school, and would marry the homecoming queen. He was the seventh son of a blue-collar family that would ultimately move across the country to San Diego, California, during wartime in World War II. Having played guitar for a band called Survivors, once Sully got his hands on a guitar, he was hooked. Owning his powerful gift of strum, the guitar Sully played was as much a part of him as his talented hands that played it. Having moved to California as a child afforded him the opportunities he would need to find others that shared his passion for music. Described as the kind of California character who seemed to have stepped straight out of a Pinchon or DeLillo novel, Sully stood six foot two with a signature handlebar mustache. Very charismatic and charming individual. His songs were steeped in mysterious vibes with the lonely melodies of days gone by crooners to the likes of Nick Drake and Graham Parsons. 
He had an impressive social circle that included Dennis Hoffer as well as other A-list celebrities and even made an uncredited appearance in the film Easy Rider. Sullivan also recorded his first record called UFO in 1969 on a small label in California. Aspiring to attract a bigger label for his music, Sully decided to leave his old life behind and start anew in Nashville, Tennessee. In 1975, Sully would leave California on his way to Nashville after separating from his wife Barbara to pursue a record deal. At the time, Barbara Sullivan worked at Capitol Records, but none of the executives there were interested in her folky singer husband at the time. But others did believe in Sully, and that was the reason he was going to Nashville. Traveling along I-40, he made a stop in Santa Rosa, New Mexico, and drifted into the desert winds, never to be heard from again. Now, this is an area where many people have gone missing and few have been found. Santa Rosa, New Mexico, particularly in the 1970s, was a small town dependent on tourists and travelers alike. Around 2,800 people called this place home, and it's surrounded by vast desert and desolation for miles around. Not much more than a pit stop in the middle of the desert, and just a few years prior in the 60s, a major stop for travelers on the old Route 66. Santa Rosa became a mainstay stop for travelers, mainly for fuel and snacks, after I-40 cut through the small town. Sullivan was one of these travelers in 1975 when he stopped in Santa Rosa in his gray VW van. March 5th of that year is when things took a turn for the worse. After having been pulled over on suspicion of driving while intoxicated, Jim Sullivan stopped in Santa Rosa, New Mexico and rented a hotel room, which he never stayed in. He contacted his wife and had a very cryptic conversation with her. You wouldn't believe it if I told you, Sullivan is reported as saying to his estranged wife. Jim, what's the matter? Is anything wrong? She asked. If I just forget it, I'll call you from Nashville. But Sullivan would never make it. Days later, after no word from him, Barbara Sullivan called hospitals, police departments along the route until she tracked down a department that had made contact with him for the traffic stop. An officer is quoted as telling her that Sullivan isn't in jail, but if you ask me, that's where he belongs. Although he had passed a sobriety test and was let go. Sullivan made his way to La Mesa Motel in Santa Rosa and rented a room, but it's reported that during the search for him, the bed was still made and the room was as pristine as when it was rented out. March 8, 1975, Sullivan's great VW was towed from a rough Mesa-studded area 24 miles south of Santa Rosa, and all his belongings, including his prized 12-string guitar, were inside. A cattle hand, Pete Senna, worked for the ranch near the area where Sullivan's VW van was found and had seen him that day and asked if he needed a ride. We thought he was some cowboy, Cena said. He had a handlebar mustache just like a cattle hand we knew. Sullivan declined help and Cena was presumably the last person to see him. Friends and family immediately knew something was wrong and one friend went as far as to say, I knew he wasn't coming back. Jim would never have left his guitar after learning of the guitar being found inside the van. Police continued to search for Jim Sullivan, but they never turned up any new clues as to his whereabouts. Sullivan's brothers would take up the cause and conduct their own searches, but nothing was ever found. There were several articles placed in newspapers asking for the public's help in finding the man. Rumors and speculations as to Sullivan's disappearance and the mysterious circumstances that surrounded the case fueled rumors. Some say he was abducted by aliens, others claim there were mafia ties, and then some people think that he just walked away from his life. Those are just a few of the rumors that people told and retold for years to come. Sullivan's estranged wife recounts finding solace in thinking he was abducted by aliens. It was a lot easier than the alternative, she was quoted as saying. In 2019, Matt Sullivan, no relation, heard the song Jerome, off of Jim Sullivan's UFO album and was transfixed by the folky, bluesy American sound. It wasn't even a maybe, he says. Within the first 30 seconds of Jerome, I knew I wanted to record it and put it out. Matt Sullivan is the founder of Lights in the Attic, a small independent record label. Wanting to know more about the artist, Matt and his filmmaker wife, Jennifer Moz, enlisted the help of a private detective and another musician to help investigate the late Sullivan's missing Santa Rosa hours and disappearance. 
They met and talked to a lot of people that had earlier spoken to Sullivan the day he went missing or had their own theories. We traced his last known whereabouts. We met his family. It was incredibly emotional, Matt Sullivan said. The re-release of UFO in 2010 exponentially outperformed the original release and the same year it was promoted on Coast to Coast AM, where people called in with their theories on the mysterious disappearance of the talented James Sully Sullivan. Number 8. Connie Converse Born Elizabeth Eaton Converse, August 4, 1924, in Laconia, New Hampshire, Connie was raised by religiously strict parents in a time that was difficult for women to break through into professional music careers. Converse would win a college scholarship, but would never even finish high school, choosing instead to pack up and move to New York. Being exposed to the counterculture of the Bohemians and the Beatniks in the 1950s, Converse started her music career in the exclusive Greenwich Village, New York scene. In 1974, Connie Converse would go missing and her disappearance would become as much of an enigma as much of her life was. In 1954, a friend of Converse helped her record her first set of songs in the kitchen of their home. Working for a printing firm at the time, Converse was passionate about her music and would later be attributed as the first modern singer-songwriter. Arguably, some of the most hauntingly beautiful songs of the time her acoustic sound and sophistication of melodies were done with ease and set her apart from other folk performers in that era, such as Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie. Not known as the strongest vocalist or the best instrument player, Converse was, however, able to deliver an intimacy and depth in her music that wouldn't be duplicated again for decades. She sang about arguing lovers, promiscuity, loneliness, and other life events that were taboo for a lady to even speak of in those times, let alone sing about. These songs came from somewhere deep within Converse, almost like she'd lived them. Maybe she had. There was a hurt and vulnerability in her voice that came out through the words and catches the listener right in the feelings. The friend that helped her record her songs would later say, The more I thought about it, the songs were all about herself. After leaving music behind, Converse would go on to edit the Journal of Conflict Resolution, did amateur cartoon drawings, and was a very vocal political activist. After the recording of that first demo in the kitchen and trying to make a go of her music career, Converse became depressed because the songs weren't being picked up by any producers or radio stations. This is where her life would take a major turn. To deal with the depression she was encountering, Converse would turn to drinking heavily. Her depression never receded and seemed to be relentless. Decades after recording her first song, Connie Converse would finally get the recognition and admiration for her music she so desperately sought in the 1950s. In 2009, a small New York label would come across her recordings and produce an album called How Sad, How Lonely. The music, considering when it was recorded, sounds eerily contemporary, David Herman of Squirrel Thing Records said of Converse's music. He would go on to say, her voice is really compelling. Add that to the fact this was a woman writing singer-songwriter style music in the mid-50s, before being a singer-songwriter was even a thing, and before a female singer-songwriter was something that people were used to. Add that with the mystery of her disappearance, the whole thing leaves you with more questions than answers. There would also be a 40-minute documentary by American filmmaker Andrea Kahn's dedicated to the rediscovery of Connie Converse at the Sensoria Film and Music Festival that was played on Connie Converse Tribute Night. Connie would also find a cult following decades after she gave up on her music career. People are still drawn to her folk style and her adult contemporary lyrics and sound. With the release of her songs and the documentary, Connie Converse finally has some of the spotlight she envisioned so many decades ago. In the summer of 1974, and just days before her 50th birthday, Connie Converse wrote friends and family to let them know of her plans to leave her Michigan home and start fresh somewhere else. Her plans were only known to her as she packed her belongings in her VW Beetle and drove off into the night. She hasn't been seen nor heard from since. Number 7. Scott Smith, bassist for the rock band Loverboy. Loverboy, the band, was wildly popular in the 80s with some songs on their roster like Working for the Weekend, which went to number one in Canada and the U.S., Loving Every Minute of It, number one in the U.S., This Could Be the Night, 
number one in the U.S., and When It's Over, which went to number one in the U.S. Collectively, they sold over 23 million records and were not a one-hit wonder. Loverboy, originally named Coverboy by lead guitarist Paul Dean, but later changed, was formed in Canada in 1978, but toured the world over many times. Smith was the founding member of the band and bassist for the group for the entire time. Their debut was opening for the band KISS in Vancouver, British Columbia, and they still sell out concerts to this day. In the year 2000, Smith was on a boat bound for Mexico from Vancouver, British Columbia with two friends and his girlfriend when a storm started to stir the waves into 25-foot swells that eventually knocked the boat onto the port side of the Golden Gate Bridge off the coast of Ocean Beach, California. Friend Bill Ellis, who was also on the boat, was down in the cabin changing into storm gear, and when he made his way back to the controls, Smith was missing, along with the boat's steering wheel. The remaining crew was able to get the boat upright eventually and come about to the area where Smith was last seen. There was no sign of Smith nor any debris, even though they searched for an hour. The two friends were unharmed, and the girlfriend was treated for hypothermia and released from a nearby hospital. The Coast Guard was called, and a search was started, but hampered by weather and a heavy fog that rolled into the area. 133 square miles were searched, but no sign of Smith was ever found. A private search and rescue was also done, but they were also unable to recover anything from the wreckage and never located Smith's body. Experts weighing in on the missing persons case suggest that no one could survive in those waters for more than two and a half hours due to hypothermia and sharks. Scott Smith was just 45 years old. The band resumed touring a year after his disappearance in Smith's memory. Number 6. Oscar Zeta Acosta, also known as Dr. Gonzo. He was born April 8, 1935 in El Paso, Texas. Acosta was an activist, lawyer, politician, novelist, and was Hunter S. Thompson's muse for his 1972 book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, and appeared as the character Dr. Gonzo. Having made his mark defending the East Side 13, a staged high school walkout to protest education inequalities for Mexican Americans, which saw 13 men charged with conspiracy for the planning of around 20,000 students walking out of their schools for the protest. A highly controversial figure, but beloved in the Mexican American community, Acosta would contact his son to let him know he was in Cineola, Mexico, right before he disappeared. He was never seen again. Having grown up in Texas, Acosta played football in high school and was president of his student body. After graduating, he departed for Panama, where he was in the United States Air Force and became a Baptist preacher. Deciding to return to the States, Acosta entered night school to become a lawyer. This allowed him to become the lawyer for the Chicano movement, helping immigrants from Mexico fight for civil rights. Being a lawyer also helped Acosta run for sheriff of Los Angeles with the promise of ultimate dissolution of the department. Acosta received over 100,000 votes, but needed a million or more to win. A close friend of Hunter S. Thompson, he would regularly accompany the writer to Las Vegas while Thompson was collecting information for his best-selling book turned movie, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. The dust cover of the book would show Acosta and Thompson sitting at the bar at Caesar's Palace shot glasses empty of their whiskey, and a salt shaker of illicit substance at the ready. The book will portray Acosta as a 300-pound drug-addled Samoan, when in reality he was a 200-pound Mexican-American. This would be the only complaint he would have about how he was portrayed in the book. Many people knew that Acosta would often show up in court barefoot and high. Thompson would explain that his reasoning for the portrayal of his friend was to keep the LAPD and court officials from harassing Acosta, as he was a lawyer in the area. A documentary on the life of Oscar Zeta Acosta was released called The Rise and Fall of the Brown Buffalo and can be found here on YouTube. It follows Acosta's education, activist rallies that he held, his defense of the East LA 13, his run for sheriff, and his two-book deal depicting his life in an autobiography. The book, called Revolt of the Cockroach People, follows his career as a lawyer and supporter of Mexican-American civil rights. We are the janitors of the world, Acosta is quoted as saying. He also gives his opinion on the militia-type behaviors by police agencies on Americans, and especially minorities. Acosta has strong views on this subject and said that they are not a policing agency any longer, they are a militia. These type quotes made him a legend in the minds of Mexican-Americans, 
as Acosta was fighting for their rights. During the making of The Rise and Fall of the Brown Buffalo, the producers were able to use rare footage and lines recorded before Acosta's disappearance in his own voice. This was an amazing accomplishment because other than Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, Acosta was rarely filmed in public. Acosta was married to Socorro Aguaniga, a paralegal, folklorico dancer, and also a Chicana activist. She was able to introduce Acosta to many of the key figures in the Chicano movement. They had one son together that has kept his father's case alive for decades, never giving up hope of information that would lead to finding him. Very little details have been released on Acosta's disappearance. In the 44 years plus since his disappearance, Oscar Zeta Acosta has become an almost mythical legend due to the huge cult following for Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, both the book and the movie. His missing person case is considered cold and has had no new leads in decades. Number five, Michael Rockefeller. And we will note here that Rockefeller is rumored to be the most stolen name in high society. There are a lot of people that claim to be Rockefellers that aren't, but Michael was the real deal. He was born into American royalty on May 13, 1938, in New York, to a father that would eventually become the New York governor, Nelson Rockefeller. In 1961, seven months into a world tour, the catamaran Rockefeller was on overturned and he was thrown into the water after being hit by a wave near Osmot off the shores of New Guinea. He made it to shore, but was then never seen again. Here's where the disappearance turned strange. At first, it was presumed that the famous Rockefeller drowned and was lost to the waters forever. However, conspiracies and wild accusations about local tribesmen living in cannibalistic colonies were accused of killing and consuming the 23-year-old. Now, while it's true that the area does have colonies that probably have never seen a piece of paper nor a light bulb and do practice cannibalism in some instances, that particular act is usually reserved for elders that have passed away in the tribes and the members consume the body to inherit specific traits the wild spirits of or even the soul of their deceased family member. In other words, it's done as a means of ancestor worship and they wouldn't eat an outsider. The debate as to the young Rockefeller's fate is still debated to this day. At the time of Michael Rockefeller's disappearance, there was no high society page in the newspaper to cover such stories. Years later, there was a documentary made for Netflix in 2014 called The Search for Michael Rockefeller. There was also a Broadway play a rock song, a book, and a TV series in the 1980s. The fact is, no one really knows what happened to Michael Rockefeller, and speculation on this strange case is bound to create whispers, all the way from high society gatherings to magazine articles for years to come. Number four, Barbara Newell Follett. Barbara was a jazz age prodigy writer. She was born in 1914 in Hanover, New Hampshire, she was a high achiever from the start, having published her first novel, The House Without Windows, by the tender age of 12. She was destined to go far in life. The progeny of literary legacy Wilson Follett, who was a literary critic and professor, and Helen Thomas Follett, famed children's author, she was homeschooled and showed great promise at a very young age. She also created her own language she called Farksu, which she spoke in her imaginary world called Farksolia. By age four, she'd started writing poetry and was well on her way to being an American great. Her first novel, which was started at age eight and finished by 12, had to be recalled by memory as the original manuscript was lost in a fire. The novel was critically acclaimed and launched Follett into celebrity status as she turned just 13 years old. The Voyage of the Norman Day, her next book, was released in 1928. And while she was writing this novel, she was also reviewing and editing for other writers. Appearing on radio shows and the cover of several magazines of the era, Follett was the talk of the town. Later that same year, her father would leave her mother for another woman. Perhaps having been her muse, leaving her father left her spinning out of control and she stopped writing altogether. This is a small writing from Follett at that difficult time as to what she was feeling. It reads, My dreams are going through their death flurries. I thought they were all safely buried, but sometimes they stir in their grave making my heartstrings twinge. I mean, no particular dream, you understand? But the whole radiant flock of them together, with their rainbow wings, iridescent, bright, soaring, glorious, sublime. 
They are dying before the steel javelins and arrows of a world of time and money. At age 16, Violet would move to New York with her mother during the Depression, and what a hard life it was for the teenager. She would go on to take a secretary job and meet her future husband, whom she married in 1931. She was said to have been the happiest in these years as a wife, but she couldn't get any of her writing published until 1934, when she penned her third novel, Lost Island, followed by a fourth, Travels Without a Donkey, which was to be her last. Suspecting her husband of infidelity, their marriage began to fall apart, and one night, finding themselves in a heated argument, Violet walked out of their apartment and into the night, never to be seen again. She wasn't reported missing until two weeks later by her husband, and he would wait a further four months to request a missing persons bulletin be published for her. No one recognized her married name, and so little attention was paid by the public until 1966, when a newspaper would write about the disappearance, and it finally hit the mainstream media. Violet could have changed the face of the literary world forever, but she went missing just as she was starting to really live her life. Her mother suspected Follett's husband of having something to do with her disappearance and penned a letter to him that can be read online. Follett's father made several pleas for her to either come home or her safe return, but no clues ever surfaced. In a haunting excerpt taken from her first novel, Barbara Newell Follett wrote, She would be invisible forever to all mortals save those few who have minds to believe, eyes to see. To these she is ever present, the spirit of nature, a sprite of the meadow, a naiad of lakes, a nymph of the woods. Number three, Glenn Miller, also known as Alton Glenn Miller, leader of the Glenn Miller Orchestra. Glenn was born on March 1st, 1904 in Clarinda, Iowa, United States. Miller, a master of big band composition, arranged pieces such as Pennsylvania 65,000, In the Mood, Moodlight Serenade, and many others still popular to swing and big band lovers to this day. The musically talented Miller attended elementary school in North Platte, Nebraska, taking a job milking cows and was able to purchase his first musical instrument, a trombone, to play in the town orchestra. At this time in his life, his family had moved to Grant City, Missouri, where Miller would pick up the art of mastering other musical instruments. In 1918, their family would move one more time to Fort Morgan, Colorado, where Miller would attend high school and play football, where he would lead his team to the Northern Colorado American Football Conference in 1920, being named the best left end in Colorado. He would graduate the following year with the intention of becoming a professional musician. 1923, Miller would see himself attending college at the University of Colorado in Boulder, where he would fail three of his five classes because he was more interested in attending plays and musicals in the city than he was in studying. He would drop out soon after failing the classes to pursue his music career full-time. Playing for several musical bands around Los Angeles, Miller would be mentored by some of the most talented musicians of the era. This would allow him time to hone his craft and form the band he wanted. Soon, after having his part as a solo trombonist cut after another musician was hired, Miller decided to start composing and arranging his own pieces. In 1928, he would have a book published called Glenn Miller's 125 Jazz Breaks for Trombones and would write his first composition called 1411. Becoming successful in his music career, Miller was ready to settle down and arranged for his college sweetheart, Helen Berger, to marry him. Having his band, Benny Goodman's Boys, they would make their way to New York City, joining bands to play for a couple of Broadway shows. His first movie appearance would be on the big broadcast of 1936. Finding it difficult to separate themselves from other big bands of the time, they disbanded in 1938 after a show in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Miller's success wasn't over, though. In 1939, he would play Carnegie Hall, a very prestigious and important milestone for musicians at that time. In 1941, Glenn Miller would put his music career on hold to enter the Air Force in World War II as an officer with the rank of Special Services Officer and eventually reaching the rank of Major. He would play in big bands for the military, touring around several countries with the band. On December 15, 1944, Miller would board a plane leaving England bound for Paris. The small engine plane was lost over the English Channel due to what was speculated to be a frozen fuel line on the plane. Another theory is friendly fire took the small plane down, or even enemy fire may have been the result. Alton Glenn Miller was awarded a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award, and on March 24, 1945, 
was presented to Miller's wife, Helen Miller. No trace of the plane nor the remains of Alton Glenn Miller was ever found. Number two, Licorice McKechnie, a.k.a. Christina McKechnie. She was born on October 2, 1945, in Edinburgh, Scotland. As a child, she loved writing poetry and would incorporate those writings into her music as an adult. Hanging out at local music clubs, McKechnie would meet the man that would introduce her to the person that would make her aspirations of being a musician come true. In 1961, Herbert Jansch and McKechnie would meet at one of those local clubs. Jansch had quit his job as a nurseryman to become a full-time musician, and recognizing McKechnie's talent, introduced her to his flatmate, Robin Williamson, that would create the band that would launch her into stardom. McKechnie's folksy voice and how she presented on stage made making her a star very easy. Looking to move and take their act to London, the three friends played local clubs and saved money to make the move. In 1963, the threesome did indeed make the move, and drawing from American acts such as Pete Seeger and Woody Guthrie, the trio practiced and played in London clubs together for a while. The plan was for Jansch and McKechnie to marry, and those plans went forward for a while. But without notice or reason, Jansch left London for Morocco and left McKechnie behind with Williamson. They decided to head back to Edinburgh, and Williamson would pick up a gig with a local duo, Clive Palmer, playing once a week in the Crown Bar. Williamson and McKechnie would become close and started dating during this time. Jansch had returned for a short time to the area, but after being given another chance to play with the band, soon left again. During this time, McKechnie didn't sting nor play. Williamson was touring around locally with Clive Palmer still and held auditions for a guitar player. They hired a guy named Mike Heron and named the band The Great String Band. Having been discovered by a small record label, the trio was asked to come to London and make a record. Again, McKechnie moved with her boyfriend but was still not active with the band. After winning an award, the band broke up and everyone went their separate ways. Williamson and McKechnie made their way back to Edinburgh. Getting back together with Heron, they resurrected the great string band and started the second album, Enter Licorice McKechnie. She started appearing along with the band, not just as Williamson's girlfriend, but as a part of the creative process. Williamson and McKechnie would go to Morocco and bring back several exotic instruments that the band would incorporate into their music. In 1967, they would record the second album, and Licorice McKechnie was born out of the ashes into a vocalist for the band. The album went to number one in the UK. Next stop was Bigger Clubs, and they were invited to play at the Speakeasy Club, the Queen Elizabeth Hall, and the UFO Club, all famous in the British music scene. They would record their third album with the cut The Minotaur's Song being a favorite of the band and fans alike. They were nominated for a Grammy in the US, and would add one more band member in 1968 named Rose Simpson. Invited to play at Woodstock, the band would come to America, but there were major issues. From the start, their performance seemed doomed. They were removed from their original spot and ended up playing on a date when fans were getting rowdy and tired. The band was left out of the recording of the entire festival and the soundtrack. Then McKechnie started to practice Scientology. This left her bandmates feeling isolated from her, and she left the band in 1972. The remaining members disbanded in 74, and that was the end of what was known as the Incredible String Band. Little is known about McKechnie's life from this point on. What is known is she married a musician named Brian Lambert, and divorced sometime in the 80s. The last time anyone heard from her was in 1990, and it was her sister that would be the last person she would talk to. She was reported missing late that year, and it was surmised that McKechnie was last seen hiking in the Arizona desert. Although little is known about Christine Licorice McKechnie, one thing is for certain. She had an amazing voice and brought a genre of music to the United States that we may not have if not for her. And number one, Hart Crane, aka Harold Hart Crane. Hart was born on June 21st, 1899, and was a modern American poet that had a style likened to T.S. Eliot. He was labeled difficult and highly stylized by critics. Born in Garrettsville, Ohio, he would lead a quiet and tragic life, as do many poets. Born to a business-driven father that invented lifesavers, Crane would be driven to be a success at an early age. However, Crane would leave high school his sophomore year and travel to New York City. His parents divorced soon after, and Crane took it particularly hard. 
He would become published in the 1920s by several literary magazines with white buildings containing his best writings. Not much more is known about the creative poet other than the loss of his father destroyed him. On April 27, 1932, Crane was on a cruise back to New York. After having an altercation with a staff member and having been drinking heavily that day, it is speculated that Crane either jumped, fell, or was pushed off the ship into the water. His remains were never found. On his tombstone, a simple epitaph carved, Harold Hart Crane, 1899-1932, lost at sea. Well, there you have it, folks. Ten famous people, celebrities, if you will, lost and never found. If there are other celebrities you'd like to hear about in a future episode, drop us an email. The address is in the description. Look forward to your comments on this one. Please, though, keep it friendly and respectful. In the meanwhile, be good to yourselves and each other. Stay safe out there. And I'll see you a little farther on down the trail. I'm Steve Stockton, and I'll talk to you next time. Tell your animals Steve says hi.